So let's, uh, let's get into the Word of God this morning, amen? Amen. So we've been uh, continuing on through uh, a series in the book of John, and we're going to be in it for some time. And uh, we're continuing on. Today's text is found in John chapter 8, verses 12 to 58. So I'm just going to bow in a word of prayer here. Lord, help me to be able to articulate the Word as you would have people understand it, Lord, I pray that you would, you would just use it to minister um, truth to people. Your word is truth and your word is light. And we thank you, God, for the opportunity to open it. And we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So John chapter 8, 12 to 58. So the, the setting here is after the, the Feast of Tabernacles was over. This was the last feast prior to Christ um, going to the Passover to be crucified. So there, uh, there was a whole bunch of people from all over the place that were in the city of Jerusalem at the, on the Temple Mount taking part in the Feast of Tabernacles uh, celebration. And uh, after the Feast of Tabernacles was over, Jesus had introduced some teaching during the Feast of Tabernacles, but he continued after everyone started to leave. But there was a number of people that stayed, um, and they wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. Um, so they sought out Jesus in the temple courts, and Jesus uh, was on the temple courts, and, and, and he was teaching, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and teachers of the law, of course, they were not supporting Jesus. They didn't like what Jesus represented, how he was carrying himself, and what he was saying, uh, a lot of what he was saying. So they, they, they were actually looking for a way to get rid of him. Um, they wanted to kill him, as a matter of fact. So... They felt, they, I guess they felt threatened and unsettled by Jesus. And they had a critical spirit towards him. And, uh, well, they, they had, uh, during Jesus' teaching, they interrupted him, as a matter of fact, and they brought, they brought a, a lady who had been caught in the act of adultery. And they brought this lady before him on the Temple Mount. And they, they asked him um, about having her executed and what he had to say about that. And they were trying to, they were trying to set him up. And they were trying to um, use the woman as a pawn. But Jesus answered them quickly and wisely, and he diffused the whole scheme. And the outcome was that um, Jesus was able to continue teaching. So that's where we're kind of picking up. He had just dealt with that issue with the lady who had been caught in adultery. And he had just dealt that issue. We're not going to get into that because I've already preached that. So for you who are uh, new here this morning, refer that uh, the passage before, uh, John chapter 8, 1 to 12, to, to see that whole story. So here's this mixed group of people. So you have people that are here, and they're genuinely interested in hearing what Jesus had to say. And then you've got this other group of people that are really interested in trying to take Jesus out. So you got both critical spirits and you have people that are genuinely open to hearing the voice of God and they're, they're wanting more. They, they sense there's something different about Jesus that when he speaks, he speaks with authority. He doesn't just speak empty words. His words are loaded. So we have this whole mix of people. So starting with verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, and this is after he had dealt with that scenario with the lady, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So in the first verse of our text this morning, we see Jesus claiming, he's not only claiming to be a light bearer, bringing spiritual illumination to people. And then in the New Age uh, movement, sometimes they, people will say, oh yeah, Jesus is, is, is a, yeah, he's like a guru or he's a, he's a light bringer. No, no. Jesus is not claiming to just be a light bearer. Jesus claims in this verse that he is the actual light of the world. He is not just the light bearer, but he is the light source of the world. 
Just as the sun brings light in one way, so Jesus brings light to the world in another way. It's a bold claim. Now, if you're, if you're curious and you're listening in that crowd that, that was before him, I'm sure your ears would kind of go, I am the light of the world. What, what do you mean? What he's telling people listening to him is this. He's more than just a messenger that's sent to them. Jesus is actually in that statement in the first verse of our text here. He's claiming to be the creator of the world. In the words of John in the first chapter of this book, Jesus was, what did they say in in the first chapter? He was a light shining in the darkness. And the darkness has not understood it. He was in the world, and although the world was created through him, the world did not recognize him. But as many as received him and believed in him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. So Jesus made claims, many bold claims during his earthly ministry. He told people that he was, for instance, he told people that he was the way, the truth, and the life. He also told people that he was the bread of life, the bread of heaven that had come down. He he was the bread that would satisfy the spiritual hunger of the people. He also claimed to offer living water, spiritual drink, the water of life, so that whoever would drink of the water that he would give them, they would never thirst again. And here in our text this morning, Jesus goes a step further and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, most of us here can see there's the odd person around in our society that's blind. But for those of us that can see, okay, you don't have to prove light. The neat thing about light is that light proves itself. It's apparent. When light is present, you know this. When you walk into a room that's illuminated, you know that the light is on. It's evidence. It's self-evident. But not only does it prove itself. You see, light, light also proves also everything else that's around it in close proximity to it as well. For in the light, I can walk in a path and I can see obstacles in front of me. I can see the details of how things work and how things are laid out. I can avoid pitfalls and I can pursue good things in the light. But in the darkness, a person, if you take a room and you make it completely dark and you make someone run through that room, they're not going to be very successful. If I turned all the lights off in here and somehow we were able to take those blinds and shut them so that not a single ray of light would come into this place and it was pitch black dark and I told everyone to get up and start running, what would happen? (laughs) It'd be chaos. People would be running into pews and running over each other and breaking their teeth on the floor and it'd be a terrible mess. Well, this is light in the, this is the difference between light and the darkness. As soon as you turn the lights on, I did that, you still might have some chaos, but you know, you'd be able to navigate at least around the different obstacles that were there and you'd be able to go for, for where, you're, where your destination, where you want to go in your destination. You realize where you're going. In the dark, you might be thinking you're going north and you're going south. You might, you might, you might be trying to, to achieve something in life, but completely going the opposite direction from where you really need to go to achieve it. You see, that's life in the darkness. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And when Jesus steps into your world, the lights come on. I would venture to say that no one can really know themselves, no one can really know the destination that they need to travel until they come in proximity of the spiritual light of this world. You're not going to know where to go. You're not going to know how to live your life the way that you are designed to be living it until you come into the presence of the light. 
And this is why Jesus said that whoever follows him will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, there, was there, there were people that were listening to these words of Jesus. They were believing his words. And that, the words of Christ were illuminating their hearts. He spoke to a degree that it just, it just meshed inside with so many people. But not everyone. The Pharisees challenged him. Verse 13, it says, the Pharisees challenged him. They said, here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Well, Jesus' claims were definitely bold, weren't they? To say that I am the light of the world, that's a bold claim. But Jesus' words were not lies. With the claims Jesus made about himself, if any other normal person would have made those claims, you'd say that person would be arrogant. But when you're the actual creator of the universe, you're the great I am, you're, you're telling people who you really are. The truth, in definition, is reality as it really is. When Jesus was speaking, he was speaking the truth. He was speaking reality as it really was. You see, Jesus didn't just speak the truth. He proved the truth by the way he carried himself. All the miracles that you see in the New Testament of Christ doing these fantastic miracles were his way of saying, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread that satisfies the hunger of the human soul. I am the water that quenches the thirst of the thirsty soul that needs quenching. I am. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. We saw how he fed multitudes with a, just a small amount of bread and fish. He walked on the water. All these things were, were, were shown by God to put his stamp on Jesus to say that, yes, Jesus' testimony is valid. The Pharisees knew that he did miracles, and yet they wouldn't believe. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Well, the witness of the Father was upon the life and ministry of Christ. Sadly, the thinking patterns of the Pharisees are still alive and well. And there's many in this world around us that settle into this way of thinking that the Pharisees are thinking, Jesus, you're just testifying that you're the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, right. Well, God reveals himself in different ways to different people. God still works supernaturally today in the hearts and lives of people. And with hungry hearts who are open to the Spirit of God. Today, here, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you open your heart, you lower your pride, and you look at the Lord and you say, God, show yourself. Reveal yourself to me. The Spirit of the living God will reveal the Lord Jesus Christ to you. And you will know that He is the great I Am. That He is the bread of life. He is the water that quenches the thirst. He is the light of the world. Regardless, however, there's going to be a segment of population and you're going, to, you're going to find it all around you. And regardless of how much love God shows to them or how many miracles are performed for them, their pride is such that they will not lower their ego and their pride and admit their need for a Savior. Like the Pharisees, their hearts are darkened and hardened. They can't see what they're thinking is just absolutely wrong. Well, Romans 12, 1 says this. It says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And the Apostle Paul was correct when he shared similar thoughts in, in people's responses to the teachings of of Jesus, he shared this to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 and 19. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Because the light of the world, to embrace the light of the world, you must step out in childlike faith. You have to take a step of faith or you will not believe. The human heart is too bound by darkness. You need actually God's help for you to step forward. And if you cry out to Him today, if you're listening online or you're here today and you don't know God, cry out to Him with all your heart, all that is in you, and say, Lord, I want to know you and the power of who you are. He will show it to you. He will show you who He is. I don't know how He'll show it to you, but He will. He's very creative in how He does that, by the way. I don't know. Each of us have a salvation experience that have come to Christ. God's pretty creative in how He gets our attention, isn't He? If you're here today and you know that there's something missing from your life, the, the Creator of the world is calling you. He's calling you to open your heart to Him and take a step of faith. But the Pharisees, they were dug in. They challenged Jesus on a legal point, reminding him that a person's testimony is not valid on their own. Generally speaking in law, it's not, it, you can't just produce your own testimony. There has to be some other testimony that, that states on your behalf what you're saying to be true. But, again... Jesus was speaking truth and he validated his statements by how he carried himself. So in answer to the Pharisees, in verse 14, Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. So many people in this world don't know where they came from and they don't know where they're going. The great light of the world knows who he is, knows where he is going, and he knows you, and he knows everything about your life. And he calls out to you today to surrender your life to him because he sees the path and he will illuminate your path. You come to him, you will no longer walk in darkness, but you have the light of life. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and I know where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You, pass, ju you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. See, the Lord made it abundantly clear to the Pharisees that their understanding concerning who He was and what His mission was in the world was skewed. They didn't know who He was. This is why he clarified that they were judging by human standards, not by God's standards. See, God didn't come into the world, Jesus didn't come into the world to judge the world. In his, in his appearance into the world, Jesus didn't come to, to judge them. Jesus came to save them. Yes, one day Jesus will judge everything. Okay? He will be the great judge who will judge everything. But when he first came into the world, he did not come to judge he came to save. John 3, 17 says, For God sent His Son into the world, uh, not, did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. You know, we will have to face judgment. If you go into eternity, my friend, without knowing God, if you go into eternity without the sin inside of each one of us, inside of you, the sin inside of you, if you go into eternity without that being dealt with, you will face the judgment of God. There is an eternal separation that occurs when you are judged by God and the sin is not taken care of. The penalty of sin is death here and now, but more importantly, the penalty of sin is death eternally. And God does not want you to suffer that penalty the result of your sins. He wants to save you from that. 2 Corinthians 5.10 states, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And I tell you this much, 
Not one of us is good enough to enter heaven on our own steam, on our own merit, on your own good works. You're not going to be good enough. The only way you're going to be good enough is your sin is taken away, is washed away, is, is atoned for, is taken care of, is removed from you. And that's the purpose of Jesus. Jesus is the Savior And this is the purpose of God's Word this morning. It's to illuminate us, to show us where we ought to put our feet. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you need to be very serious about getting your life straight with Jesus Christ because you don't know what day you're going to end in this realm. There is no guarantee that you're not going to crash your car on the way home or you're going to have a heart attack or whatever. There is no guarantee that you're walking out of this place alive in the next five minutes. No guarantees. Eternity is a very close thing, no matter how you slice it. Okay? It's important that you reconcile what I'm saying here this morning. If you don't know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. And it takes a step of faith and a step of surrender to come into the light for Him to show you that He is the way and to show you the way that you can be saved. And it's really very simple. Believe in Jesus as your Savior. Be willing to turn away from your life of sin and walk in repentance to Him. And He'll take your sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west and He'll put His Holy Spirit inside of you. Which is the guarantee. It's a seal guaranteeing what is to come. Eternal life. John 1.14 tells us concerning Jesus, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The living Word of God. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace offering us something that we don't deserve. God's righteousness in exchange for our sin. Beautiful. The grace of God is so wonderful. And it's offered through Jesus. And the truth is offered through Jesus. Truth. Do you, you want reality as it really is? That's what truth is. And that's what Jesus offers. Authenticity. This world is so full of fake stuff out there. There's so much fakery. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ, His way is authentic. It is true. And then Jesus didn't come to judge. He says, but if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. So the Pharisees were judging on human terms. They looked at Jesus and and they did their research in the background, right? I mean, They they knew that he was raised in Nazareth, so a lot of them assumed that he was born in Nazareth. Well, there's no one from Nazareth that's going to be the Messiah. What's going on with that? They didn't look far enough. They made assumptions that were wrong. Many of the Pharisees were probably aware that Jesus was born, or that Mary was, was pregnant prior to being married to Joseph. They were probably aware of that. They would have eagerly wanted to exploit and use that one against Jesus. They likely deduced that Jesus was the son of this carpenter from Nazareth and that his mother was pregnant with him before marriage. That's something that just doesn't go away. Those are rumors that go around in circles in communities, small communities. It's reasonable to assume that they thought Jesus was a product of a sinful relationship with an earthly father. When Je- but when Jesus spoke of his father, they likely thought, huh, yeah, huh. And who is your father now, hey? Who is your father? They weren't asking the question um, because they wanted to know the answer. They were trying to mock him. The question they were about to ask him was loaded with contempt. So they said in verse 19, then they asked him, where is your father? Jesus said this, you do not know me or my father. 
Jesus replied, If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where offerings were put, yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus knew the contempt that his opposers had for him. And in his response for that loaded question, Jesus clarifies that they didn't know his father, they didn't know who he was or where he came from. They assumed, they assumed, but they didn't know. Yes, he lived in Nazareth, but he was not born in Nazareth. They failed to see the prophecy was fulfilled because Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the little town of Bethlehem, because at the time of his birth, there was a census that was put out, and they had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem to register, and that's where Jesus was born. In fulfillment of the prophecy in Micah chapter 2, 7, which states, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me, who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. The reality is that Jesus Christ was the one of whom the prophet Isaiah predicted would be the Messiah in his utterance in Isaiah 7, 13, and 14. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. It is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. The ancient prophecy was fulfilled right in front of their noses and they didn't see it. Jesus Christ did not have a human father. He was born of a virgin. When the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, she became pregnant with the Son of God. And Jesus Christ, who was teaching in front of these Pharisees, was not an ordinary man. He was both fully man and fully God in all of His glory. So with this in mind, the Lord, knowing their hearts, continued to speak in verse 21. Once more Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. And this made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? That was mockery too. They knew if someone killed themselves in Jewish thought, that was it. You're going to hell. They, they were just mocking him left, right, and center. But he continued, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. The matter of fact is, that everyone that was, was listening to Jesus and everyone that's listening to me today was born into sin. We're all sinners. Yeah, we are. We are born, if a person says they're not, they're lying. The truth's not in you if, if you say you're not a sinner. In Psalm 51, 5, David said this, King David said this, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. This is true of many people, and, and most of you who have been involved in church for a long time know this scripture that states in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody needs a Savior because the penalty of sin is death. We need a Savior. That's why God sent one, because He loves us. That's why Jesus came and became human flesh so that he was fully God and fully flesh. The wages of sin is death. But if our sins are dealt with here and now on this side of death by trusting in Jesus, what he did to save us, we can avoid dying in our sins. Jesus is God's Messiah. 
He told the Pharisees, unless you believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Today, the same can be said. People try to find salvation in many other pathways. My friends, people are looking to spiritualism. I'm spiritual. I have a faith. A faith in what? There's only one way to receive salvation. There is not many pathways to that. The only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ, God's holy Lamb that came down and offered Himself as an exchange for your sin. He died in your stead. He died instead of you. When Jesus went to the cross, He went with full control and He willingly gave His life so that you wouldn't have to die, so that you could have life. That's the story of the Gospel. The good news is that you don't have to perish. You can come to repentance. Repentance means turning away from what bound you before and coming into the newness of life. You can do that. <coughs> Some think that it doesn't matter what you believe. My friend, it does matter what you believe. There is only one way. Jesus said, I'm not a way to the truth. He didn't say, I'm, a, I'm an illumination expert here, a guru that's going to give you illumination to a pathway that will lead you to truth. No, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That's the Word of God. And the Word of God is truth. And truth is reality as it really is. But the Pharisees' hearts were far from God. They couldn't see the light because their hearts were darkened and their understanding was darkened. They were filled with pride and stubbornness to do things their own way. They didn't want to yield to God's way. God's Word shows us the way that we're to live. And unless we're willing to submit to that, we cannot be saved. We must be able to come to that place, and God gives us the grace to do that, by the way. And He's desiring that all should come to repentance. When we come to that place where we see our need for a Savior, and we see that we need to turn away from our life of sin, and we walk and take a step of faith towards God and say, Jesus, I don't know everything. I don't know much, Lord, but I do know this, that I need You. Would you take away my sin? Would you carry my sin on the cross? Would you cast my sin as far as the east is from the west? Would you change my heart, O oh God? Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, to be like you. For you are holy, O oh God, and I desire to know you and the power of who you are. You do that, my friend, and God will fill you with His Spirit. Your sin will be taken and you will be changed. Old things will pass away and all things will be new. Oh, who are you, they asked. The Pharisees asked Jesus. Again, they asked him. Just what I've been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy. And what I have heard from him, I tell to the world. The word of God that we, it, we are preaching this morning doesn't come from human beings. It comes from God himself. The Bible is God's word truth as it really reality as it really is they did not understand that he was telling them about his father with the heavenly father so jesus said when you have lifted up the son of man then you will know that i am he and that i do nothing on my own but speak just what the father has taught me the one who sent me is with me he has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. See, not everybody that day that was listening to Jesus had a hardened heart like the Pharisees did. And I believe there is even some Pharisees that were listening. And the Holy Spirit was tugging at them and going, Listen. See, there were some Pharisees just like the the one in, 
in the beginning part of John, Nicodemus, if you remember, a ruling Pharisee. He says, nobody could be doing these wonderful miracles that you're doing unless God was with them. So there were some of these guys that were listening. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I am He and that I do nothing on my own. Jesus came into the world to be lifted up. Did you know that? He didn't just come into the world to teach, which He did. Jesus taught Wonderful thing is just like what we're hearing today. Jesus came to be lifted up. Jesus came to be hung on a cross. He knew before he even came what was going to happen. He knew that he would be lifted up. Now, there's that old song that people used to sing, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, you'll, I will draw all men unto me. Lovely song, and, and if you take it in a certain aspect, yeah, we need to elevate Jesus wherever we go. That scripture's out of context. That scripture that says, uh, lift Jesus up higher, lift him up for the world to see. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw him into me. It's not talking about Jesus gaining popularity by lifting him up. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about, if I be lifted up from the earth, if the Romans grab me, beat me, throw me on the cross, and pound the spikes through my wrists and through my feet, and, 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 and jam the crown of thorns over my head and hoist me up on the cross and drop me into that hole in the ground. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men into me because I am dying instead of them. And that's why Jesus, when he looked out at the crowds, he was able to say with compassion in his voice, even when he was writhing in pain, he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. That was Jesus and all of his glory and his love. Yes, it was hard for him to go to the cross, and when he went to the cross, before he went to the cross, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed. He prayed, Lord, if it be possible to remove this cup from me, please. He's talking to the Father. His physical flesh knows what's coming, and he knows how painful it's going to be. And if there's any other way, he, wanted, he didn't want to face that. But nevertheless, he said, Thy will be done. And he submitted himself to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God elevated Jesus above the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus everyone in heaven and earth and under the earth will proclaim that he is Lord over all. The Lord Jesus Christ is alive and he wants to be your, he wants to be in you, living in you and through you. He wants to be the light that illuminates your path so that you'll never walk in darkness. This is good news, my friend. But where is your heart? This is the question. Where is your heart? There's four types of hearts that are out there. The first heart is the heart like the Pharisees that were resisting the Lord had. It was hardened and darkened, just like a path that, that's been trodden down, that's packed, packed solid. Jesus says there's four kinds of hearts. He taught in Matthew 13, the state of hearts. He says a sower, a farmer, Farmer sower. If you don't know what sowing is, kids, it's like when farmers take seed and they put it on the soil. Sower went out into the, into the field and he threw the, the seed out into the ground. And the first, the ground represents the human heart and every one of us has a state of heart. And some of the hearts that people have are hardened and when the, the word of God, the truth about Jesus hits the heart, it bounces off the hardness of the heart. And then the crows come down and pick it off. The devil comes right away and snatches the, the seed of God's word away from that person. They're hard and nothing penetrates their hearts. That's the one kind of heart. The second kind of heart has some soil, some, uh, I guess, receptivity to it. But there's other things in that person's life. They'll say, Jesus, yeah, I, I know that I need you. I need you to meet these needs in my life. And they might even line them out. Like, I need you to meet this need, this need, this need in my life. Everything that I'm approaching Jesus for is all about me. I will give you this part of my life, Jesus, but this part right here, I want the, these parts for myself. So what happens to that soil? It's like rocky soil. When, when, when soil is mingled with big chunks of rock, 
The soil, it's the soil is shallow, and the, and the roots, when the, when the seed goes on it, yeah, it starts to grow, but it, and it starts to germinate, but because of the rocks, as soon as the heat gets turned on in life, as soon as things get tough, that person just withers up, backs away, and goes, you know what? And this is the kind of person that will say, I tried that Christianity thing. It didn't work for me. I'm telling you, if you accept Jesus Christ for who he is, the living water for who he is, and the light gets turned on in your life, you are never the same. You're never going to be the same. You can't taste of the Lord and just go, oh yeah, whatever. I tried that, you know. This is Christianity where people say, they pray a prayer and they have terms for God. I'll do this, this, and this, and I'll give you this, this, and this, but I won't give you these things. Those are stones, hardened places in the heart where the word of God bounces off. The word, the seed of the word of God bounces off. Doesn't, it starts to germinate and starts to grow, but doesn't come. See, the, par- the farmer didn't plant his fields. He didn't plant his fields just to see a few green things sprouting here and there. The farmer plants his fields to gain a harvest from the, from the fields. This person never sees a harvest. As soon as the sun beats down on it, it shrivels up, goes away, dries up. And then there's the heart with the weeds. Well, guess what? When we come to the Lord, we have come with philosophical positions inside of us. And, and sometimes people walk and they, and they come to the Lord and they say, yeah, Jesus, I see what you're saying and I see the truth of your word and I'm accepting the truth of your word. Yeah, but I've got these other philosophies and I think, I think this way, you know? I, I, I think this way. Philosophies of this world dependent upon human understanding and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Philosophies? What is philosophies, kids? It's the way you think about things. See, God has a philosophy for living. It's contained in his word. And when we accept it, it's like good seed that's planted in there. And it, when it's watered, it comes to life. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, the Bible says. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judging the thoughts and tents of the heart. This word of God penetrates our spirit, penetrates our soul. It's living and it comes to life. But if I'm, on, if I go, I'm, I'm holding philosophies of a different kind along with it, you see, I, I, can, I can say, yeah, Jesus, I like these philosophies that you're presenting. I like your phil- philosophical approach to life. I agree with it. But... I also like this too, you know. This is kind of what I grew up with. What I think, see, what I think, see, when you have a circumstance like that, there's competing philosophies that grow and and competing philosophies that are watered. Philosophies in this world are watered all over the internet. You get tied in there and start listening. Oh, that's really tasty. That's really interesting philosophy, right? Well, what does that say in relation to the Word of God? Is it opposing what the Word of God is telling you? Is the attitude, the actions, the motives for doing things different than what Jesus would promote? That's a competing philosophy, and it is not of Christ. And if you allow competing philosophies to grow inside of you, they will grow up with you in, in your heart. And you know what's going to happen. Yet you're going to see spiritual life and growth. And you might even bear a little bit of fruit. But you ever see a garden that's filled with weeds? You have the, you have the plants that are kind of straggly string beans growing up in there. Rather than being healthy, the, soil is, the energy of the soil is being put into the, other plant, into the competing plants, into the weeds. It chokes out the productivity of that plant. See, God is not just wanting you to be a Christian that just skates. <laughs> and in Judgment Day, the gates of hell just sort of catch you on the backside. And, Ooh, that was close. You know? That's not God's desire for his children. 
God wants you to live abundantly in Him. Yes? There's going to be people that are going to barely... But there's really very little fruit in their life here. Right? That's being produced. The fruit of righteousness, I'm talking. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. These are the, the fruit that God desires is righteousness being born in his children. He wants a righteous harvest, a rich harvest that produces a hundredfold, you know, just like boom, this harvest of health, spiritual health, rich welcome into the kingdom of God. Not because we're after rewards, but because we're so thankful to be living for God that He saved us. We're so excited that we can't help but share the news of Christ with others. And as a result, we grow strong. And this is the fourth kind of heart. The seeds have been sterilized. The weed seeds have been sterilized out of that soil. It's been like, or they've been plucked through, however they, ha they happen to be um, taken care of. And the, sea, the, the third kind of heart is rich, deep soil that's free of weeds and stones. God, I'm, I'm all yours. Did you know that you've, if you give God everything that you are and everything that you have, He will return to you His fullness? Did you know that? God has, God has an adventure for you like none other. Don't short-circuit that by being caught up in the philosophies of this world and having them choke you out or be free in the Lord. If you give God everything that you are and everything that you have, be amazed. God's going to do incredible things in and through your life. Things that you wouldn't even imagine possible. It's a great adventure being a, 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 a genuine believer in Christ. Well, the, the Lord speaks to the churches in the, New Test in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, doesn't he? There's some churches that are doing quite well and then some that are quite, quite sickly. I'd put it to you that the church of Laodicea, the last church, the, the, the church in Revelation chapter 3 that Jesus talks about being, being a church that thinks they're rich but is impoverished in many ways, that church is a church where people are weedy. But the, you see, God doesn't give up on his people. If we got a weedy heart, God has a remedy. The, the whole purpose of the word is to show us reality as it really is. And the truth is this, that if you are suffering from a lack of love for God, a lack of love for others, or if you're thinking that you're cruising along but you're really spiritually sickly, right? Oh yeah, I've got what I need. I go to church every whatever, once every three weeks or once every month or once every week or three times a week. Right? It, what God wants is your heart. And, and your heart, yes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to follow through with how you carry yourself. But God's interest in your heart. Give Him your, your heart. And I know I'm punching this point fairly hard, but it's so, so important, folks. If we find our heart is a Laodicean heart where we think we're rich and in need of nothing, but in reality we're poor, wretched, blind, and naked spiritually, the Lord has a remedy for this. You don't have to live with a weedy heart. He says, I counsel you to buy salve for your eyes. So that your blindness can be taken away. Gold, purified in the fire. So that you will have true riches. And the gold that's refined in the fire, that's the spirit of the living God in you. Pursue God. Pursue Him. Not just for what you can get out of it, but for who He is because you love Him. Pursue Him. He's calling out. He's saying, come to me, all you who are burdened and weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you've got a weedy heart, I've got salve to put on your eyes that will help you to see. I've got gold that you can have there. You can have real riches 
where you think you have riches because you're kind of skating, but you can have genuine treasuries of heaven. I have this for you. And not only that, but I have this robe, this glorious white robe that I will put across your shoulders because you're my child and I love you and I want you to know that my righteousness will cover you like a robe. You can be rich. Rich. You don't have to settle for poverty in Christ. You don't have to settle for it. He says, I counsel you to buy from me. That means buy in. Pastor Clint, what you're saying today is really interesting. Yes, it's really interesting, but if it just stops at interest, it's not, it's not hitting where it needs to hit. It's got to go beyond interest into buying in. I counsel you to buy from me. Gold refined in the fire, salve to put on your eyes. I've got this rich, rich robe to put around you to cover your shameful nakedness. And the good news is that the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, I will come in, I will open the door and come in and eat with him and he with me. This is the, this is the hope. We don't have to skate in the shallows. We can go into the deep. Because the Lord, Lord has a plan and a purpose for each one of you. Jesus is the light of the world. Aren't you glad that he eliminated the world for us so that we can see we can see that there's no way to real satisfaction in life without him aren't you glad that he's done that I am amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved this wretch I once was lost but now I'm found was blind, but now I see the light. Would you give Christ everything this morning? If, you, if you're struggling and you're dancing in the philosophies of this world or you've got stony ground or maybe you've got a hardened heart and everything that has ever been said to you has been plucked away like those Pharisees. But I want you to know that God in heaven saves, delivers, and heals. He's still the same today as he was yesterday, and he will be this way forever. If you've got a hardened heart, God can break up the hardened ground and till it up. If you've got stones inside you that you've never been willing to give to the Lord and you've kept them to yourself, and you said, I just won't, I won't surrender these areas of my life, you can surrender them to the Lord today, and he will take them. He'll take them from you. If you need weeding, he's an expert, and he'll do it right. Friends, God wants you to bear much good fruit. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this day that you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. We thank you for your word and the power of your revelation. Lord, today, if there's people here that need to know you as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, after the service, come up and we can pray. If you're out there online and you need this, you can pray in your heart and ask Jesus to take away your sin and to fill you with his Spirit, and he will do it. If you're here today and you're a Christian and you're really struggling with the philosophies of the world entangled in them and you're just feeling so unsatisfied because you're just living in the shallows God's calling you to come to him on deep waters. And he wants to set you free. He wants to open your eyes with the salve that he can give you. He wants to remove those stones that are in your heart. And he wants to give you pure gold refined in the fire, the spirit of God. If you're here today and you've been wondering, you just need refreshing. You need a renewal of your love. This is for you. God's righteousness is, is powerful and it will cover you like a blanket. Just come to him, all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. 
In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.